Uh, good morning, and I want to thank you for inviting me here to talk to you. Uh, I've never been to Niagara Falls, so seeing the water was a real treat yesterday. And uh, I am from the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, Soldier Center, and I'm going to be talking about some of the technologies that we're working on now in order to feed our soldiers and make sure they have appropriate nutrition in a variety of situations. And again, this is at the interface of technology and health because our soldiers um, are, they, they have to perform well and they need the fuel to do that. So Natick Labs is chartered to do R&D on all of the support services for the military, everything they need personally and individually except for their weaponry. So we have um, R&D labs on the food, the clothing, the tents and other shelters, protective gear, uh, boots, shoes, chemical protection as well. And I am from the Combat Feeding Directorate. And we are chartered to work on food that will feed the soldiers in the multitude of situations and climates that they will find themselves. So our motto is um, the global leader um, from deep sea to deep space, and we provide an operationally relevant R&D base to deliver solutions for evolving field challenges. And in the combat feeding program, we have several uh, key objectives. And the first one is uh, to provide what we call overmatch. So that we want the soldiers to be fueled and to be ready to be able to do whatever they have to do, uh, regardless of the climate or the situation. And that might mean nutritional optimization for improved performance. Um, for example, maybe they need to be able to sleep better. Maybe they need to have a, you know, assured um, blood sugar control if they're not eating properly. Um, they also will probably need help in recovering um, from injuries or, or overuse, um, muscle soreness, and they might need to have psychological resilience as well. Another huge effort is to reduce what we call the logistics burden. And that is what the soldiers have to carry. So it is not unusual for a soldier to have up to 100 pounds that they have to carry on their back. That can be their um, protective gear, that can be their instrumentation, uh, that's their weaponry as well. Um, so food is sometimes the least important thing to the soldier. Sometimes to them that's just an added burden and they don't really like that. Um, and so having small, what we call small footprint items that are low weight and easily carried um, is something that can increase maneuverability as well as to promote nutrition. And we uh, do have to modularize our, our foods and our gear toward the specific missions. And um, sometimes, you know, the individual nutrition is important too, based upon what the soldiers might individually need or what they might have preferences for. So uh, the key is that we're always uh, doing innovative research and our rations will probably look significantly different by 2025, just the way they look very different now from what they were 10 years ago. So comparing the requirements for army food to the requirements for typical commercial food, um, there are some things that we have in common and some things that we um, you know, have different goals for. Of course, we want our food to be nutritious and to be safe and to be acceptable so that it will be consumed. Um, but we differ from industry in that we have an extremely long shelf life requirement. Our foods, especially the MREs, um, I might re say that term again in the, the talk, and that refers to meal ready to eat. That's the standard army ration, which comes in an over pouch. And that has a shelf stability requirement of three years at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is much, much longer than the commercial sector has to contend with. And not only does it have to be good um, and safe after three years, it has to be something the soldier will want to eat. That's because um, for a large army, we have to have stockpiles of rations that can be drawn on in case there is um, sudden mobilization. And they also have to be producible by industry. We have several large suppliers, producers, that have the contracts to actually make the foods that we develop. And of course, it has to be accepted by the, the warfighter. 
So within CFD, we have about 100 uh, researchers and engineers uh, with different backgrounds. And so the, the things that we contribute to are the, uh, you know, first of all, product development. And then we have nutritionists and biochemists that are looking at the nutritional quality of the food. Um, we have engineers that will um, try to optimize the processes to make these foods. And I'm going to talk about three of those today. Uh, we have microbiologists that are making sure that the food is safe, um, especially after long shelf lives. And we also have a, a um, packaging group that is developing innovative packaging materials for the uh, for the foods. So the Army operates everywhere. Um, cold climates, hot climates, um, you might have groups together, the soldiers might be individually deployed for a while, um, some of them might have heavy activity or be heavily loaded um, if, if they're fielded, if they're um, actually in combat situations, or even if they're training. And others are just doing what you might imagine, like, you know, regular desk jobs. So, for example, we, we have two different soldiers here. Uh, one is an infantry warfighter. The other is a motor transport operator who would be uh, just in a stationary position. So the activity level varies dramatically. The, um, the warfighter in infantry would have a very high activity level uh, compared to a light or a stationary activity level for the motor transport operator. Um, the environment for the warfighter can be extreme. It can be very cold. It could be in a desert too, or it could be on a mountaintop, um, high altitude, below um, limited oxygen. And then the motor transport operator might be in an urban setting. So the caloric needs of these two individuals will be very different. The, uh, the warfighter will probably have a caloric requirement that is at least double of the, um, the person who has a more stationary job. Um, so that, that person is likely to be calorically deficient, probably not consuming enough food for his duties, uh, his or her duties. And he might especially have muscle fatigue just from overuse and the gear that, that he has to carry. Um, the motor transport operator, especially if that's, um, if that's a woman, could be iron deficient. We see that uh, very frequently with our, our female recruits, um, and both of them could be sleep deprived. They also might have different dietary preferences, uh, for example, pork free or, or vegan, and then they also might have food sensitivities, um, for example, a sensitivity to dairy or to, to gluten. So how do we accommodate that? We, we feed many, many different um, types of soldiers. And they can be in desert environments, in mountains. Um, they can be uh, isolated for a while. And we also accommodate um, U-2 pilots that are above, um, they are high altitudes so that they're encased and they have oxygen piped. And they have to eat through a port in their helmet. So we actually make foods for them. We call them tube foods, so they're like big toothpaste tubes, and then they're just squeezed into their, their tube. And that's how they eat if they're in the air for hours. So how does the military contend with feeding all these different kinds of troops and all different kinds of scenarios? So one way, and this is what I'm going to focus on, is innovative engineering technologies. Uh, these are processes that allow us to make the foods that we need for all these scenarios, and in particular, intense scenarios, um, for training, for combat situations, where the soldier has to carry uh, all their food with them. So the three I'm going to be talking about today are 3D printing, a sonic agglomeration and vacuum microwave drying. Uh, these are three uh, very new types of technologies in the food industry. So these technologies help us with two major goals. Uh, you know, two things, personalization of the ration components and also weight and volume reduction. Uh, personalization is something that we're always trying to tend toward and that will increase the soldier morale uh, make them happier, and it might also make them comply better with nutritional requirements, make them eat more or more of the food that we, we supply so that they do have adequate nutrition. Weight and volume reduction is a huge area now, and that is for mobility. Um, the, 
The newest ration we're working on, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is the close combat assault ration. And the goals for that are to have about a day's, a pound of food per day, and they're predicting that the soldiers might need to carry seven days of food. Um, so they'll have water separately, but that's seven pounds of food to feed them for a week. So how do you do that? Um, first process I'll talk about is 3D printing, and that is customizable food on demand. And this is a basic research project that we've had for um, a couple of years now, and this would be in the, the yellow area. So this is uh, something that we're foreseeing as a possibility for the troops in maybe 10 to 20 years. So uh, 3D printing is a process whereby you, <coughs> you develop, you build a designed food product layer by layer by forcing the food through a small nozzle. And the printer will iteratively build the food structure layer by layer by laying out one layer according to a design and putting another layer on top of it. So that is controlled by software. And basically, theoretically, anything that you can conceive of and design and put into a CAD system, you can print. And so you can have a multitude of shapes. Now, the reason that we're interested in 3D printing for soldiers is that it can potentially provide personalized nutrition that's tailored to the individual and his or her real-time needs. So if you can design something and have a printer either in or close to the battlefield and then have a delivery system for the soldiers, that can be fresh food that's prepared for the soldier according to um, his or her dietary needs and the situational needs. So it can be customized and you can add whatever ingredients that you might need to or like to for different environments such as high altitude or cold or intense combat. So it does a couple of important things. That will reduce the, the carrying load of the soldier and you know make because they don't like to carry extra food. So that would be something that would be um, prepared for them nearby. And um, it also reduces the shelf life requirement because these would be freshly prepared. Um, it reduces packaging waste and also any risk of, of transport. Um, so it does address the individual dietary needs and preferences. So I have a few slides here now that I'm gonna show you that have pretty pictures. So this is the art of the possible. And um, 3D printing is really pretty new in the food area, but it's been picked up in particular by confectionery companies. Chocolate prints very well, you can see the, the bar. Um, cookies and dough will be will print very well, and you can have any kinds of shape. You can have um, you know, different sized holes in them, different patterns, and then very often 3D printers are interfaced with other auxiliary equipment too, like ovens. So you can print something in the shape that you want and then send it right to a baker. And then um, the cake on the other lower picture um, shows that you can have uh, you know, by printing layer by layer, you can have different components so you can see that there is a C embedded in the, the cake. And then the upper left hand picture is a, a gelatin rocket ship. So um, confectionaries um, are the, the things that have been printed in industries so far primarily, and also uh, pasta manufacturers have been to pick this up. And so you see a couple of different printed pasta shapes on, on the left. And uh, this is something that some high-end restaurants are interested in, that a customer can actually pick out and determine the, the shape of the pasta that they like. And they can print it there um, at, the, at that time for the customer. Um, so the two pictures on the right are of pizzas, and the one on the top is a printed pizza in the shape of Italy. And then the, the one on the bottom is um, something that shows that you can 3D print layers, so you can print the, the dough and then have that baked and then deposit the sauce and the cheese on top of it. And as a matter of fact, NASA had a, a contract where they actually had somebody design a 3D printer that would make pizza for them. And this is something they were interested in in the space station or possibly Mars mission. And 
Sometimes printing can verge on art. There's some really beautiful things that have been made. And these are two food materials. On the left is an octopus, eyes and all. And that's, uh, that's also gelatin based. And on the right is a cake. And not only the cake, but the stand had been 3D printed. You can do quite a bit with, with sponge sugar. So the, the why of 3D printed foods, and again, this is yellow zone, which is um, another like 10 or, or 20 years. So what we would like ultimately with this technology is to be able to outfit a soldier with sensors that will tell their uh, biological situation and, and what they might need physiologically. And then that data can be transmitted directly to the printer and the printer can produce a, a formulation that, that's needed. Um, for 3D printing, even though the, the food is fresh, you do have to pre-position the starting materials, but those are usually dry, you know, the flowers, the sugar, the protein powders, whatever you need, and those can be in canisters and be pre-positioned. And then they can be blended um, according to a, a, a customized design. And then um, if the printer is off-site, you can actually deliver these these foods uh, to the soldier by, by drone. <coughs> so this is sort of our, um, our objective for the, the medium term. So what we're doing now is more basic research. And um, our technical approach has involved adapting a, printer, a plastics printer to the food by making sure that everything that contacts the food is, is food grade. And we're working on developing and characterizing the, the food matrices that we're going to be putting through the printer. Um, these are things that have to be, they're viscous fluids usually, and they have to be something that flows through the nozzle. And um, they have to be viscous enough to build up a structure. So you can use that and you can have your, your matrices contain specific um, nutrients that you'd like. And we've also had to think about requirements for the supply materials, post-processing, um, there's software that runs the printer, and then um, there, there are different things that are interfaced with the printer, for example, um, ovens. So, Printability is not really easy. It takes a lot. You saw beautiful pictures, but that takes a lot of R&D. So you have to have the correct settings to print. You have to have the correct size nozzles. Um, you have to control the printing speed. So it's both the speed of deposition of the fluid coming out and also the speed of travel of the head. And you might, depending on what you are printing, you might or you might not get a structure that stays together. So the structural integrity is something that you have to design for. Viscosity refers to the thickness of the fluid. The print stream has to be appropriately viscous so that it will build a structure um, and not, not just be too fluid and fall apart, but it also has something that, that can be forced through the nozzle and also um, hopefully the, the layers will bond to each other so you can effectively build the structure. So it's, it is really pretty tricky. Um, we've looked at possible nutrient instability from the printer and haven't, haven't seen anything this far. And another issue with 3D printing is what are the consumers going to think of it? Um, okay, they have this piece of chocolate that looks very nice or uh, a baked product, and then when they, they hear that it's been extruded through a nozzle, will that affect their, their perception of the food? So 3D printing, again, is, is a system. You have software that runs it. Um, you have the sensors, ultimately, in order to drive the type of thing you want to print. Um, you have to consider the loading of the supplies, what the raw ingredients are going to be, where they are, and how they're going to be fed into the printer. And this has to be ultimately um, in proximity to the warfighter. So you know, either right at the battlefield where they can take their food, or consider some delivery mechanism, for example, drones. So it isn't just a printer, it's all the um, other like, surrounding support that is needed. And, and where are we now? So we do have a research project and we are primarily looking at the printability of sort of simple solutions. We're looking at, at protein suspensions and looking at the effect of um, different emulsifiers and, and oils to see what that does to the rheological properties and also correlating that with how well we can build up a, a structure. We do collaborate with a couple of international printing companies and consortia. Um, and th this is really big in the Netherlands. 
And um, we also have a small business innovative research contract to a company called BHAX. And they just acquired the, they just won the phase two of that contract for the next two years. And they'll be building a 12 head printer and that will be printing six fluid streams and six particulate streams because you can have your, you know, your dough or your, your chocolate um, or your protein suspension. Then you can also have particulate such as mixed nuts and you know, ground things. Um, so you can, you can have a blend as you build up your structure. Um, so that's where we are with 3D printing, and that is probably in the, in the yellow zone. That's something that can be very useful in the future, but the, the research base now is pretty much at a fundamental level. So the next one I'm going to talk about is a process called vacuum <coughs> microwave drying. And, this, and then the one after this are technologies that help us produce uh, lightweight and small rations. And the next two are focused on uh, assisting mobility. 3D printed foods are things that will be made for the soldier. The next two things are um, ways to make food that the soldier can easily carry and use in the battlefield. So uh, the, the goal of these technologies is to reduce what we call the ration footprint. Um, so um, we, we want to um, lessen the burden on the soldier and um, make sure that they, even though the, the foods that they have are small and lightweight, that they do have appropriate nutritional um, and sensory quality. So vacuum microwave drying, and I might refer to it as VMD, that combines two familiar processes. Uh, one is vacuum, which is just reduced air pressure or suction, and the other is uh, microwaves, and that is for fast heating. So vacuum drying, uh, vacuum, a vacuum condition will assist drying because it um, changes the boiling point of water. So what happens is that as water vaporizes, it develops a pressure, and then that pressure will inhibit the, the further vaporization of the water unless it's sucked away. So if you have a vacuum, you're gonna be losing more water. You change the, the boiling point, and you also reduce the pressure, and so that, that drives vaporization. And then microwaves, as you all know, is a, um, a quick way to heat. And that's because um, the things that absorb the microwave energy in food will vibrate, in particular, the water. So water is a dipole, so microwaves will make it flip very, uh, very fast, and that causes friction inside the food. Um, so the molecular vibration will um, cause a temperature rise, and then water is vaporized, even in the interior of the food, and then the internal heating in the food will cause that vapor, vaporized water to rise to the surface where it can be evaporated. So um, microwaves cause almost an internal pumping inside the food. That, so when you combine microwave heating with vacuums, you get very fast drying because you're mobilizing the water in the interior of the food and then it's rising to the surface and then it's sucked away by the vacuum system. So uh, vacuum microwave drying is a very fast drying technique and it's also something that will give you high quality rations because it's fast and you can use relatively low temperatures. That's always the issue with dehydrated foods, how much quality degradation do you have, you know, either in the, the flavor or in the, the nutrient content. Um, this shows Natick's uh, 10 kilowatt vacuum microwave, micro, vacuum microwave dryer. So the in middle part is the chamber, and that's a rotating drum. If you have small foods to small particles that are fairly uniform and not fragile, you put them in directly and um, the, the drum rotates and so the, the food is tumbled, and that helps the drying rate. If you have something that's more delicate, we have about half a dozen trays that can be hung from it, and then the, the food uh, remains on uh, an even level, but it's still rotated through the dryer. So we obtained this um, about half a year ago, and we've done a lot of work with it. So um, an important issue with the, the micro, vacuum microwave drying is that that will give you a low weight food, because you're removing the water weight, but that doesn't help you much with the bulkiness. So what we would like to do ultimately is to compress that food. And that will give you both a lightweight and a compact food. 
Um, this slide show, we've, we've been using this for um, a variety of things since we've had it. And in particular, um, things that will simulate meals, um, you know, high protein foods, because you, you have energy bars, but they're all sweet. So we want something that is more um, balanced across macronutrients, that has protein in it, and that will seem more like a meal. So these are eggs. On the left are just scrambled eggs, and on the right is a, a vegetable omelet. So you start out with a very moist system, and then you use a vacuum like dryer to dry it to a water activity of 1.8. Water activity refers to the, the partial pressure affected by the, the water and the food. So that is something that's important for stability, in that um, microbes will only grow with water that, that's available. So anything less than about 0.8 is something that is probably fairly shelf-stable. So that, that's fairly dry, um, but it's, it has enough water in it so that it's slightly plastic so that we can compress it. So when we compress it, um, we actually have a bar. So it's, um, it's, it's dry, it's lightweight, and that it's low volume as well. And these kinds of foods are um, useful because they're ready to eat if that's necessary, if the soldier doesn't have enough time to prepare a meal, or they can be rehydrated. And because it's a gentle drying process, um, and it still has a, a little bit of water to be somewhat plastic, it hydrates well, and you can have your, your scrambled eggs or your omelet back. So if a soldier is um, isolated and under intense activity, they can eat the bars. If they have a little bit more time and can heat water, or maybe if they're, they're eating together, they can rehydrate the bars and have something that's like a meal. So um, the, the vacuum microwave dryer can be used on whole foods, you know, for like pieces of meat and cheese and, and fresh fruits and vegetables as well. And um, that all brings me to the last process I'm going to be telling you about, which is something called ultrasonic agglomeration. And that's another process that gives you enhanced quality lightweight ration components. <coughs> so ultrasonic agglomeration is a compression process that uses sonic energy as well. And that's something that helps you maintain the, the quality of the food. Um, so this is something we're looking at in order to develop the next generation of compressed ration components. And these are going to be feeding into the close combat assault ration that I mentioned before. So these are high quality compressed bars um, with prescribed macronutrient distributions. And again, the payoff for the Army is that they are nutritionally balanced and low weight and easily carried. And um, these these technologies do preserve quality, so the sensory properties of these foods are really pretty high, have been demonstrated to be high. So there, uh, there is the compression process in industry, and usually that just is something that has a plunger of force particles together, and that's called the standard uniacyl compression. So when you do that, um, you wind up with a structure that has fairly, uh, relatively few number of interparticle junctions, and they're pretty weak. Um, the, the, the junctions are a low area, and they're not really stable. That's why a lot of power bars, compressed bars, have um, a high proportion of syrup or sugars in them, just to make them tacky enough so the particles will stay together. Um, and you know, the compressed products that we've made uh, are not. Um, don't have the best quality because they might not be entirely compressed and they also um, tend to be sweet because they have these syrups. So it's, it's a limited process. However, when you combine compression with sonication, you have um, a much easier way to make the particles adhere. If you sonicate, the particles will vibrate and then they can move around so there's a closer packing, and then there is some heat developed on the surfaces of the particles, and there's a little bit of plastization or softening, so the particles can be pushed most closely together. And whatever softening then um, can, is reversed when the, the sonication ends and the, the product removes to, um, returns to room temperature. It doesn't get very hot, but it can, it can heat to a certain extent. So you have a product there, that um, has very robust interparticle junctions, and it turns out it has a very nice textural quality too that um, people like. 
Um, so this just shows the schematic of how we do the compression. We have a cell, and then we have a cross tip that comes down. And for standard compression, that is just um, a, a bar that you know, uses force um, for the driving for the um, for the source of compression. Um, there's only totally normal force from the downward pressure. But for sonic compression, that cross set is actually a sonic horn that vibrates ultrasonically. And so that transmits the sonic energy to the particle bed and um, causes the plasticization and causes the particles to adhere. So this is a picture of the um, sonic horn and a sample cell. And um, that happens to be, this is from one of our contractors. This was developed by one of our collaborators under a small business innovative research contract. And they um, did a wonderful job and we actually bought one of these recently. But for this one, he has a, a horn that's heart shaped and you can see that the, the well is also heart shaped. Um, my big boss doesn't like this, this slide because he doesn't think that the soldier should be getting heart shaped food, but I, I think it's cute. <laughs> and, and on the right is one of the products that we made using this technique. It's an Italian bruschetta bar. So it has breadcrumbs, it has seeds, and it has quite a bit of cheese, and it, it's like uh, sort of a, a midi meal. And there are many other things that we made as well, um, like chili con carne. If you can dehydrate things, um, you can combine them and you can make a bar using this process. So we've tested these foods. There were four different major formulations that we tested with the soldiers, two savory meal type, chili con carne and um, the bruschetta, and the two sweeter, a mocha bar and a, uh, a coconut almond bar. And so we took these into soldier venues to see how they were uh, perceived. Now the soldiers need, know that they need more calories for intense activity, and they know they get hungry, so they're well aware of this. So for the elite soldiers, you know, um, for the rangers, say, they, they liked these. Um, so we tested these with the 82nd Airborne and also a ranger at a rifling exercise and also at um, the Concord, New Hampshire training facility. And the concept was applauded. They say they get hungry and they want to be able to carry more calories and they want something that's easy to eat. And they like the products themselves very much. So their, their comments were things like the more compact nutrition, the better. It's a good lightweight snack. It's an upgrade over the other, other MRV snack items because it's nutrient dense, because they're, they can be pretty high in protein. We formulate them to have a, a minimum level of protein. And also the size is handy and it's good for maneuverability. So they like them. So where are we now? Um, the last two technologies I talked about are transitioning into our new close combat assault ration. So this is not fielded yet. We're still developing it. We're still looking at concepts. And we, we um, recently made a whole bunch of different items that are going to be tested by the troops. And they're, they're going to, you know, some of them are going to be selected for further um, development by the manu manufacturers. So this is what it might look like. This is like one, one idea of it. And you can see there, um, there is a, a dehydrated meat bar, like a beef jerky. Um, the yellow one is a cheese bar. So what uh, we did for that one is actually take uh, cheese that had been vacuum microwave dried. This is on the market as well, called Moon Cheese. And it's, it's a good product, it's tasty. Um, but we can actually compress that and make that into a bar. So it looks like a hunk of cheese, um, but it doesn't have the moisture. So it's lightweight and it's not hard or anything. It's sort of like a crunchy cheese. Um, and then there are like a nut and seed bar. So this is still um, under consideration, but this is the, the biggest push for us now. Um, so there are many things that we're testing and uh, we'll, we'll be doing field studies. So in conclusion, these innovative processes will not only feed the soldier in the future, but may transition into what all of us will eat. Because um, the technology for the Army, uh, the, the troops has a tendency of being picked up by industry. You know, for example, M&Ms were developed for the Army at one point, and so, so was Tang. So I did have a slide asking for questions, but I guess we're going to wait for that. Thank you very much.